Mrs. Reinhardt. Present. Mr. Sampson. Present. Mrs. Wigani. Present. Dr. Pickett. Present. Dr. Goodwine. Present. Mr. Lacey. Here. Seven present. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. May we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight we'll start things off with a special presentation from Chief Dooley. Uh, Dr. Lolly, would you like to introduce Chief Dooley and what the presentation will be about, please? Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Smith. Uh, we are um, uh, presenting for the board's approval the program of studies. We do this every year. Uh, the program of studies is an outline of all the courses that are offered throughout the school district, including CTE classes and some CCP classes that are offered inside the buildings. Um, this process allows us to have approval from the board for any courses that we're going to be teaching, and then if we were to have textbooks or curriculum guides for them, you would also see those. This does not stop us from adding something later on in the spring if we find that we want to add a class or, or add a new course. What would happen then is that a course of study would be developed, and then that would be brought to the board for approval consequently allowing it to be added to the program of studies. Approval of the program of studies would not need to reoccur, just that course of study for that uh, particular course that we were adding. So it's a, it's a two-step process beforehand, one-step process once this has been approved. So Chief Dooley. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Smith, Dr. Lally, and board members. Um, I have a presentation that I think Sharice is pulling up for us, just some slides to follow along with. I want to start by um, give just a little background information about the program of studies. Um, our first version of this was created in 2017. Um, Dr. Lolly, uh, the DPS counselors that she supervised at that time, and members of the curriculum department wrote the original document and each of those parties have participated in the annual revision process each year. Um, each year, as Dr. Lally stated, the document is approved by the Board of Education, and then revisions are shared prior to that annual approval. I wanted to kind of talk you through the scheduling process a little bit. Let me go forward one slide. Thank you. Um, we ask the principals every year to survey their teachers and find out if there are uh, available uh, electives that they want to teach um, so that we can continue to uh, add some variety to our course offerings. Um, the counselors then make presentations to all of the students um, about graduation requirements, about honors diplomas, the courses that are available, and then they point out highlights in the program of studies, such as um, maybe graduation <laughs> admission requirements to uh, colleges. The next step in the process is they generate scheduling worksheets. They share those worksheets with the students. Um, the students select their core classes and their electives, and those are tallied up. And that tally then determines what the master schedule is for the school and that ultimately generates the student's schedules. So that's kind of an overview of the process. So we have three, we have three, we have high, several high school programs. Uh, we have three traditional high schools, uh, Dunbar, Belmont, and Thurgood Marshall STEM. We have two career tech high schools, Meadowdale and Ponents, one arts magnet school, Stivers, and then our dropout prevention school, which is Mound Street Academy. Um, so the next slide, please. So any school can offer any of the approved non-CTE courses. Um, what each school offers is impact, impacted by student interest, um, teacher licensure, and then of course just available numbers of staff. So I gave a real brief overview of our six high schools 
um, and some of the things that they offer. Metadale, as I stated earlier, um, has CTE pathway courses. They offer currently eight college credit plus courses. Stivers has their art magnet programs. They offer three college credit plus program classes, excuse me, and 11 advanced placement classes. Ponets has their career tech pathways. They offer seven college credit plus courses and they have vocal music. Thurgood Marshall has STEM Foundations one and two. They offer four CCP classes, two advanced placement. They have instrumental program, a vocal program, and they participate in what are called the employer roundtables. We have a work coordinator, Mr. David Andrews, who works with the three traditional high schools um, trying to connect industry with students and engage them in pre-apprenticeships um, and also viable uh, pathways to getting into the workforce. So at Children's Hospital, Voss Auto, just to name a few, have been some of the participants in those roundtables. Dunbar High School offers 10 College Credit Plus courses. They have computer science. They also have business. Um, instrumental and vocal program, and they also participate in those roundtables. When our career tech pathway uh, programs were moved to Meadowdale High School, Dunbar was able to retain their computer science teacher and their business teacher, so they've been able to continue with those courses. And then at Belmont, they have an ROTC program, Navy, five college credit plus. They have business courses. They have one career tech pathway in fire and EMT. They have two KDI work programs, which are work programs specific, specifically for students with disabilities. They have an instrumental program, a vocal program. They have sheltered instruction courses for our English learners, and they also participate in those employer roundtables. So the program of studies booklet, uh, we put a copy of that on the website. We print about, about 100 copies and deliver them to the middle school so that the counselors can review them with the eighth graders. We take about 150 copies to each high school and then we make them available in the student assignment office. So some of the specific updates. Um, the class of 2023 and after graduation requirements are referred to as the permanent requirements since they were introduced several years ago. However, House Bill 110, which occurred last summer, um, did result in a few additional changes that were just updated on the website less than, really about a week ago on January the 28th. Not significant changes, but a few little tweaks. Um, the next slide is a page out of the booklet, which is really a summary for kids, a summary for parents and teachers of all of the possible ways to graduate. Um, so that graduation pathways process for 2023 and after really is divided into three sections. The first section, the state refers to that as covering the basics, which in our district, 20.5 credits are required. Plus, the student has to show competency and there's a variety of ways to do that. The fastest way to do that is just to pass the Ohio State tests and earn um, a score of 684 on Algebra 1 and the ELA 2 test. And if you pass other tests, then you automatically earn graduation seals. But this chart is really to help kids see all of the different combinations of ways that they can get across that finish line. Um, the next slide, please. So also a part of this chart um, identifies which Ohio State tests kids are required to take. They no longer have to take the ELA 1 test. That, so they went from seven tests to, to six. They do have to earn graduation seals. There are 12 of them that are defined by the state of Ohio. Nine of them have state criteria and three of them have local criteria. Our three local seals were board approved last year, so those are ready to go. And also, 
uh, remediation free scores are included on this page. So this is intended to be a, a resource for everybody in terms of how to understand the class of 2023 graduation requirements. If you can go ahead, Sharice. So the seals, those 12 seals, like I said, um, nine of them are, are state requirements, I'm sorry, state criteria, and three of them are local. But beginning this year, when students graduate, if they earn any of those seals, they, those stickers are supposed to appear on their diplomas. So we've got a process in place to make sure that that happens for this year. Um, next slide, please. College prep app opportunities. Um, advanced placement currently is offered in two, two of our high schools, although any school can offer AP courses. Um, teacher training is preferred, but it's not required. Um, basically, the teacher has to write a syllabus, submit it to College Board for approval, and then you have to agree to provide textbooks and certain materials, and you can offer advanced placement. College Credit Plus is certainly another um, alternative. Um, all of our schools offer CCP classes. Dr. Sherry Gale and I actually met with all of the principals within the last two weeks to talk about how to expand their offerings for the 22-23 school year. Um, the next program is a teacher education program. That will be a startup program. Um, basically, it is a CCP pathway as opposed to career tech where kids can take three general education college credit plus classes, three teacher education courses, and then there are pathways developed through all of those universities listed for kids to become teachers. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Lally? Um, we have worked with um, the universities very closely to get the courses. They've, they've agreed to teach, to accept the courses that have been designed by all of those universities. So it would actually be um, classes that if I choose to go after I finish high school, if I choose to go to Central State or Wright State or any of those universities, they will accept those as my courses, my, my very early on education courses, so I get a jump start on that. So we're really happy about the cooperation between those universities and the work that uh, we've been able to do with them. Thank you. Uh, the next slide, we have one new course this year, which is called Foundations of Leadership. It's a semester course, a half a credit, and basically the course does just that, studies leadership. Um, I'm really excited about this course because this course will be for kids who, one, may want to earn the three different industry credentials that are listed there. Um, or kids who need an alternate way to graduate can enroll in this course. So embedded within this class, kids will have access to what's called the Leadership Excellence Credential, which is a three-point credential. And we have about 20 teachers trained right now, two minimum per building, who are um, allowed to give that credential to kids. And then we have the Lean Six Sigma Yellow and Green Belt, which I think we mentioned last year when, we, uh, when you all approved some training. We have about 14 teachers in our district now who are, some have already achieved their black belts and some of them are getting there. Um, and they can then in turn award these credentials to kids. So again, it's a great class for anyone to sign up for, but it's also a place where kids who are struggling uh, to pass their uh, assessments can earn that alternate pathway to graduation. And then the last slide is just kind of going back to the requirements, and I highlighted in blue what specifically that course will address, and that is an option for to graduate. It'll give kids their 12 points of credentials, and then down at the bottom in blue, it says earns an Ohio Means Jobs Readiness Seal. So those two things together can get the kids across the finish line to graduate uh, if they're struggling with passing their Ohio State tests. And so that concludes my presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Chief Woolley. Um, I have a couple of questions, and then I'm gonna pass it off to the board if there are uh, further questions. One, with the teacher pathway, have there been any conversations around 
ways that say our students, is this one on? Now I'm on. Are there ways for our students to say if they did go on to a central state, a world before, say, a right state, is there any kind of incentive uh, to when for them to come back and teach inside of DPS? Hmm. It's a good we, one. We've talked about that and we've um, uh, actually not put anything on paper yet for that, but one of the things that could actually um, happen is as students are going through there, it would be very similar to what we did with our para to teacher model. And we, we say that as you um, get ready to student teach, you come back and you student teach in Dayton Public and they do a great job for us. We make sure that they have um, a contract before they actually graduate. Um, that's what we're thinking at this point in time. Uh, we've, we've worked through quite a few things on that, but um, haven't really put anything to paper yet. Um, and hopefully by the time that we recruit enough students, we will be able to say that to them that, listen, if you, if you come back and you student teach here, you know, this is the pathway that you can follow into the workforce. Okay, I appreciate that. And then one more uh, for, for now. In what ways are we utilizing middle school and elementary school uh, to prepare, one, to prepare those students for the offerings we have, and then also to look at what are some possible new offerings, what are some things that could change based on uh, some of our elementary and our middle school children coming up through DPS? Well, I can speak to middle school. I know last year we introduced a course called Career Connections that all middle schoolers have to take. Um, and, and during that uh, course, they get exposure to the career tech pathways that are available. Um, they connect with David Andrews, our work coordinator, to bring um, uh, information about workforce opportunities for kids. And then actually right now, our middle schoolers, our eighth graders are all visiting high schools. Uh, they hit a couple schools yesterday. Um, so through that course, they have access to opportunities that are at the high schools. And then of course the middle school counselors, which have been in place now for three years, I think. Um, as I said earlier, they do present this information to the kids. And there's, there's a lot of resources in here to help them understand you know, why you should take certain courses or how do you get an honors diploma or what are the admission requirements for North Carolina A&T if I wanna go there. So I think we still have a lot of work to do there, but I, I certainly understand and see the importance of, of focusing on those middle grades. I can't speak to elementary school. I, I can. Um, in pre-COVID, we had a position that um, was filled for career awareness, uh, and there were first grade activities all the way through sixth grade activities that were to be planned um, throughout the time, and as, as that year went by, we ended up with COVID. So we weren't able to fully implement those plans, so we went about a year and a half without anything occurring other than just basics and core content uh, because we were remote. But we have um, Dr. Gale, uh, who, who we hired this year, as you know, who's uh, in that position that uh, was vacated during the COVID situation. And she's working with teachers, she's working with outside organizations to bring in career-focused activities. We had all of those planned, uh, starting with kindergarten, and we've had to hold off because the buildings are still closed because of the COVID numbers. Uh, but as soon as the buildings are open, we're starting to have those um, presentations come into each of the buildings so the students can be aware. There are, for this year, there will likely end up just being two. Um, the big plan is to have four per grade level each year. So the student will be exposed to a variety of different careers from the time they're in kindergarten all the way through their sixth grade. The other thing that we did is we have STEM uh, teachers that um, are working in all the elementary buildings. Uh, we started off having at one STEM per building and that we couldn't quite manage that well. So what we did was we have a STEM person uh, who travels to the buildings in the quadrant and they provide STEM lessons to students there and work with them on robotics and, and things like that. So they're getting exposure to that sort of um, idea or that sort of career pathway very early on in, in the elementary as well. Um, it's probably not as much as we would like it to be at this point, but we're still working through that model and, and um, uh, kind of strengthening that as we go with that one. Uh, we tried that pre-COVID also, and uh, a lot of things got out of whack once we went into the COVID situation. So uh, we're, we're recovering from those uh, shutdowns that we had. 
and we are doing that career training for our students and, and it will be back up full force next year. Thank you, Dr. Ali. I have a couple more, but I also want to kick it off to board members. So any board members that had any questions? Dr. Pickett. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, you mentioned there were three seals that were local. If you can tell me uh, which ones those are. Um, I also want to mention that I'm really delighted to hear that teachers are also taking advantage of the Six Sigma mm -hmm. training. I mean, I, I went through that training and I know how valuable it is. And it's also extremely valuable for our students to develop that critical thinking that we need today more than ever. Thank you. Yes, we have three locally defined SEALs. One is called Community Service. Um, and students can earn 40 hours of community service over the course of their four years of high school, or they can engage in a project. Um, and the guidance counselors manage that and track that. There's tracking forms that the kids fill out and log their hours. The second local seal is the Fine and Performing Arts seal. And for that particular seal, kids uh, can earn, must earn three credits in art courses with a C or better, plus participate in three art extension activities, like are they in a play, are they in a musical, do they perform at a concert. Um, and the third local seal is a student engagement seal, and that is participation in basic school activities, playing sports, being in the National Honor Society, being on student council. So they have to be in involved in six you see it. Six school <laughs> engagement activities over the course of four years. So one season of a sport would equal one activity. So those are the three that are local. The other nine are all state criteria. Any other questions? Mr. Lacey. Okay, you lost me for a minute. Um, you were talking about teachers submitting a syllabus. Were you talking about AP courses? What were you talking I about? I was talking like? about advanced placement. AP, so, okay. Yeah, so we have, um, I believe, 11 total that are offered in our district currently, but any school can offer them uh, as long as the teacher who teaches it submits a syllabus to College Board and gets approved. That's really the criterion. And then we have to agree to provide appropriate textbooks and materials. So 11 are offered. How, how, many, how many kids are taking these? Uh, I don't have those numbers in my head, but um, at Thurgood Marshall, they have two courses. Their enrollment is low. We'd certainly like that enrollment to go up. Yeah. Um, and the, the others are all at Stivers. And some of those are low, low enrollments as well. Um, the kids tend to do best on AP language and AP literature, so those tend to be, you know, 20, 25, 30 kids in those classes. And in, in a lot of school districts, and I think we're, uh, we're similar to them, because of the CCP and the fact that I don't have to take the test and get a 3, 4, or 5 to get college credit, I can take the course at um, the university while I'm still in high school and it's paid for. Um, I think a lot of schools have lost a lot of their AP opportunities because students are taking the CCP instead. In our CCP, we have, um, we have uh, professors who come in, we have kids who go to the university, and we also have teachers, uh, DPS teachers, who've got the credential and can teach right in our buildings. So we have a variety of ways that we can get the College Credit Plus classes done. And we have a decent enrollment mm -hmm. in those, and it's increasing every year. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons we have some low enrollment in AP, and we don't have as many AP as you may have had many years ago. Thank you. I was going to go right into CCP, but thanks. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, few questions, if I may. Um, in the middle school uh, or the earlier ages, do we do an inventory interest of students, like before they get into the career pathway? Um, and the second part of that question is, do we, once a uh, scholar graduates from us, do we somehow follow to see if they're still in that career pathway? 
The reason I asked, I had a conversation with a junior who was in a high school, who was in a specific career pathway, but he's not interested in that career once he graduates. He doesn't want to go to college. He wants to go into another career. And is there some room for reevaluation? Can the young person change a career pathway in the middle of, or do they got to stick to that path, that whole high school experience? I know that was a loaded question. It's not a loaded question. Oh. It's a legitimate question because kids change their minds. Um, so to address the middle school part, currently our middle schoolers take an inventory through U Science. Um, the ESC has helped us pay for that over the years, um, which does generate interests of kids, um, aptitudes, you know, that kind of information. So when they get to their career tech, if they choose a career tech pathway and when they get there, um, there's a little wiggle room for them in the 10th grade to switch out of one program and into another if there's space. But once they get into their junior year and they're considered to be concentrators, um, we discourage that movement because we get ding, a ding for it on our report card. Um, certainly we don't want to hold kids hostage in programs that they don't want to participate in. But sometimes, you know, when the, when the content gets a little more challenging and the kid wants to maybe get out of the program, we try to push back and force them to take another look and try again. But as far as the follow-up after they graduate, that's a requirement of career tech education. Um, Dr. Rammel and her team literally contact students after graduation, and that's all reported to the state. Um, and we've not done a good job of that until last year. Um, so this year's data is uh, much better than it's been in the past as far as tracking what they're actually doing. Um, whether they stayed in that pathway, whether they went to college, whether they're working within that pathway. Um, so we do have follow-up survey data for the career tech kids. Yes, sir, Mr. Sampson. Thank you, Mr. President. My last question for now is the new course, I'm excited too about the foundation of leadership. The teachers who can offer the class, um, are they spread out in all the high schools, credentialed, where, or so we do have a teacher in every yes, building? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other board Mr. members? Dr. Goodwine and then Vice President. Got a couple questions for you. So I want to make sure I understand slide five, which is the high school programs. Now, I think I heard you say that, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, that the, the availability of teachers determines what programs are at the school. Is, was that correct? The availability of teachers. Are like individuals so, in those fields. It was, it was I th well, the licensure of the teacher can impact the kinds of courses that are offered. And then, of course, the total number of teachers that we have budgeted for any one building might create it might exclude a course because we just don't have the personnel to, to teach it. Okay, so my first couple of questions are gonna be on Thurgood, the STEM program, which, and I, as I went through and I actually did the comparison from 2017 that had the robust list of all the programs to the newer programs that just kind of had a general of all the things that were in the program of studies. And I see, I see that the science and math are there. And I see in 2018, there were four different STEM programs and then now we're down to two foundational. My question is more so is, why aren't we offering the technology and engineering portion of a STEM program if it's called a STEM school? Um, well, at one point there were three career tech programs there and the decision was made because their, their enrollment was low. Those courses were being treated like electives and not pathways. And so that was when Dr. Lally made the decision to move those programs to one building, which is where the engineering program went. Um, I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, <clears throat> we, we worked with the board uh, and opened up the CTE program at Meadowdale, but we removed, whenever I became the associate for curriculum, um, we spread out programs. We started new programs. Uh, Mr. Lacey was on the board at the time, I believe, and, and others. Um, and we put in three at every high school instead of just opponents. 
And as time went on, after uh, a couple of years, we were seeing that we weren't really in pathways. They were, the courses were being treated like electives, and the teachers uh, were saying, I don't really have a cohort of kids because it's an elective, so they, they bring them in and out. So because we wanted to have Meadowdale, uh, we had a, a facilities plan, and <clears throat> Meadowdale was next on the list for looking at what we needed to do with them to give them an identity. Uh, as a board uh, and as the administrative team, we decided that we needed to, to do a career tech program um, there, so we moved all those out uh, of that. However, two years ago, I believe it was, uh, we, we did a contract with the Dayton Regional STEM uh, consultants and asked them to come in and work with Thurgood Marshall High School on turning them into a STEM program. So they started that process and they worked with them for that full year and then the leadership changed. And then COVID happened. So Thurgood is, is the next school that we have to work through to figure out what, is it really gonna be a STEM school? Because your question's a great one. If it's called STEM, why aren't there more STEM classes? What training did the teachers need? Uh, what, what materials do they need? That sort of thing if we're going to be a STEM program. So that's the next thing that we need to, to do which we had started uh, and then had two leadership changes in COVID. So it, it, is on the, it is on the pathway to have a conversation about. Okay, and I understand that because I understand taking things out. I guess my concern with the three traditional schools is when you compare the program of studies and the things that are offered at the two career tech, the art school, it just doesn't, our commitment to equity doesn't seem here. It doesn't seem, or not even equity, equality here, because it just doesn't seem beyond a traditional class of math, science, English. And we keep talking about how the enrollment at these schools continue to go down. It seems like, is there, let me ask you, is there a correlation between the lack of programs offered and the student enrollment when compared to the other schools? Well, Belmont's enrollment has increased by 200 kids, I think, this year alone. Um, as far as the enrollment at Dunbar and Thurgood, they've been pretty steady, around 480, 520, over the last couple of years. Okay, and I have one more question, then and I'll pass it on. May I, may I oh, add something ahead. else? Um, in addition to that, any student in any high school can go any place in Dayton Public. So if, I'm, if I live in the Dunbar neighborhood, I'm allowed to go to, to Ponitz, I'm allowed to go to Meadowdale, I'm allowed to apply for Stivers. Um, if I wanna go to Belmont, I can go to Belmont if there's space. Because we have intra-district open enrollment for our high schools. So we have students that we're busing all the way across town to uh, another high school because they chose that program of studies, or not the program of studies, because the program of studies is the same, but they chose that school because they wanted to be on, on a sports team when they were a freshman, or they wanted to uh, be in the band uh, and, and they transferred to that particular building, or they applied to, because they wanted a career pathway. So we have open enrollment across the district in order to do that. One of the problems with trying to have everything in every building is we don't have the finances, number one, to support that. We also don't have the staffing to support it. We also don't have the students to support it. Um, because we have, you know, we have 500 students um, uh, average at Dunbar and Thurgood, and we have, um, is it a thousand so students over, at Belmont? A thousand. Um, so it's a, so, so it's kind me, of a juggling act. So let me ask you this question here, because typically it's in your junior and senior year where you actually start taking your elective classes. Have have you guys explored? allowing school kids from different high schools, like say if I went to Dunbar, but I was interested in the media program at Ponitz to take just those classes across sectors. We, we have not because it's really a cohort experience um, and that's why, we put, that's why we put all the CTE classes that we had scattered around um, in all the high schools, that's why we put them all in one location because the cohort experience was being missed. Um, for example, I was talking with uh, someone from Wright State today about this new teacher pathway. And one of the things that I said is I think it would be really important for this group of teacher students to do some exchanges with actual students that are in the, teaching, the teacher education program at Wright State, our kids to go on campus for a full day and work with them in their classes that they're taking, have those kinds of conversations, talk about the same books that they're supposed to be studying and, and work through that. And then those students come to, to Dayton Public. 
that takes a whole day out of my day. So in a, in a CTE program, the principal knows that might happen and the other core teachers know it might happen. So I'm gonna miss algebra. And I'm gonna miss uh, my English class that day because I'm doing my pathway stuff. So the cohort piece is really important um, to keep them together and to keep them focused in on that. That's, that's why we do it that way. Okay, so you open up another question for me because even on the teacher education, I see that, that it's, does the highlight under it at Middle Ponies mean that that's the school that that is going to? So right, because so of the cohort. They, so why not put, because teacher education, I mean, you're adding another program there, why not put that in Dunbar, Belmont, or Meadowdale, or those two schools versus the two schools that already have such a, a long offering? Because of the cohort model. Um, so we can have them in a cohort. You can't have a cohort whenever, whenever your students aren't moving as a cohort through their classes at uh, Dunbar, at Thurgood. Um, it's, it, that's what made it very difficult to have CCP classes because they don't use a cohort model. They use a kind of a traditional high school model where you, you go where you need to go instead of moving as a cohort. So that, that was the reason for that. So even, even with that one right there, I mean, I guess, so what is the plan for our traditional schools to have competitive courses or things that are setting them up beyond high school? Because it just, it doesn't seem like that's here in those. Whereas you can, even with the ROTC program, there are two, uh, two that we don't offer at all, which are military, I think Navy, not Navy, Marines and Air Force. And it's at two schools where you have Navy and Army, I believe, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you used to have three programs, but we dropped down to two, but those are still programs that could be offered. I mean, it just seems like we're not, we're not giving additional incentives in the other three schools for students to keep coming in a sense, and, that, that, and you may not have an answer for that right now, but it's just something to think about with this program of study of how, I mean, I was a black kid, and when I was a junior in high school, I asked to be transferred out of Colonel White because the curriculum wasn't challenging. It wasn't things for me to do. I actually asked to go to Northmont. My mother stopped me from that. I appreciate her because I got a full ride to college afterward, but just those type of things, when you're not challenged, there's no incentive to come, and it just, to start thinking about that in that frame of, I get that you're doing core hearts at these other schools, but the other, we have three schools that don't have those offerings, and you're gonna lose students to boredom, to not being challenged, to not seeing those type of opportunities, so. With, with the career pathway, it's better to be in a career school, like Miami Valley Career Technical Center um, would be taking some of our kids if our own students weren't already engaged at Ponens and engaged at Meadowdale High School in career pathways because usually a region has one career center like Butler Tech serves Butler County, uh, Warren County uh, serves the Warren County kids and they all go there instead. But because we have two CTE programs here, two CTE schools here, we keep Dayton kids in Dayton instead of them going to Miami Valley CTC. Um, the other thing, um, ROTC, I tried to get Air Force in here uh, a couple of years ago and, and they were not willing to um, to provide those opportunities for our students at the time because they didn't have uh, the support funding or something. But we, um, uh, Miss Kidd and I both were writing letters. She was, she was typing the letters I was writing and I was making phone calls trying to get the Air Force to come in here because I know they're at Fairborn by the, by the uh, Wright-Patterson. We wanted to put in a, an air um, program at Meadowdale at the time. And, and they didn't want to do that with us. So we did try to get an additional um, ROTC. Please keep trying. <laughs> you said it was a couple years ago, but please keep trying. That it's, getting, it's getting harder and harder for them, I think, to fund it also. We fund most of it, but they also have to provide and fund as well. I think too, Dr. Goodwine, one of the things that um, I'm feeling very optimistic about for our traditional high schools is College Credit Plus. Belmont, for example, has um, they have an excellent counselor who um, looks at the kids' GPAs in ninth and 10th grade. If they have a 3.0 or higher, she puts them in a group and they move through the five CCP classes that they offer in-house so that by the time they get to the 11th grade, those kids are on campus. There's 18 of them right now who are on Sinclair's campus for part of their day during the 11th grade pursuing whatever pathway they want. If it's vet tech, if it's pre-nursing, um, and then 
during their senior year, they only report to school for the number of periods that they're required to, and then they leave and they go back on campus. So if, if we could, um, and we need to do a better job in our other high schools of identifying those kids early and helping them move through um, our in-house offerings so that we can get them on campus and out of the school building for a period or two early when they get to the 11th and 12th grade. Those kids love it, and they are, they are making some progress because they're in the pathways of their choice, pathways we don't even offer at the other two schools. So I think that's really good, too, and I think the advantage that Belmont has over Dunbar and Thurgood is that they have that ROTC program and they have that FIRE and EMT program. So they have two additional offerings that you can aspire to be at. And just getting anything like that into the other school, even if it's a program, just seems like you would get on that, maybe get on that same excitement as you're talking about with getting them to the Sinclair campus and getting them excited about mm -hmm. life beyond high school. Yes. Well, one of the things I'll make an announcement here is for the last four or five years, we've tried to push CCP and we said to parents, it is a free associate's degree if you will just please work with your student, have them signed up. There are all kinds of supports if you're, if you're a Sinclair student, all kinds of supports that are provided in all of our buildings for students that are high school students going to um, take those university classes. We say that you have to sign up by April, so this is a free commercial <laughs> to please talk to your student's counselor and get them signed up for those classes because they, they will count as high school classes if I take my English at Sinclair, plus I pick up the college credits. If I take math at Sinclair, it counts as my high school and, and college credit. Science, any of those things, and we have pushed and pushed and pushed. If you notice our advertising, we are always pushing for college credit plus classes to be taken in our buildings or on the campus. Um, because our students need to do that. They need to have that opportunity to, to get that associate's degree paid for if they can um, and, and be able to move forward into a bachelor's. Vice President. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question about the offering any non-CTE courses. What does that look like? The how many students does it take to request a course in order to get that course offered at the particular school? What's the lag between getting the request put in and having the teacher licensure? Um, the, well, I think uh, for some of the upper level courses, like pre-calculus, Spanish three, those kinds of classes, we know that those enrollments are gonna be lower than an algebra or a world history, which every kid has to take. So we know that we have some course offerings that have enrollments with 10 kids or 12 kids but if that is something that the school values, then you find a way to work it into your schedule, knowing that you might have some other class periods with a little bit higher enrollment to accommodate that. Um, I checked all of our high school offerings and we offer pre-calculus in all of our buildings now. We couldn't say that two years ago. So we, we challenged the principals by saying, figure out how to get these things in your schedules, even if that means there's a little higher seat count in some classes over others so that we can make those upper level classes available to all kids. I forget the second part of your question. Well, the teachers, the, the teacher uh, licensure, um, let's say they have a, a comprehensive social studies license. There's a whole list of courses in our book that someone with that licensure could teach. So sociology, psychology, African-American history, et cetera. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. So you can put those courses out there as possible electives for kids to sign up for, knowing that you have someone, to te someone who can teach it versus being in a school where you might want to offer all of these computer science classes, but if you don't have someone who has the licensure to do it, and those people are very hard to find, um, then you're limited by not being able to offer those courses. So 
Like today, we had staffing meetings with um, Chief Harmon. The principals come in and say, hey, I would like to add this person so I can offer these classes. I would like to add this position with this licensure so we can offer these classes. So there's certainly, you know, Dr. Lolly and uh, Chief Harmon are, are a part of that, Dr. Burton as well, so that for those schools that want to add things or look for people with a certain license, they have an opportunity to make their ask to the people who would say yay or nay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And, and, and if I may, um, today was really a big ask for some of our high schools. They, <laughs> they came in with some good ideas this, this time. If we're going to do a CCP class, mm -hmm. we figure out what the CC mm -hmm. cla CCP classes are right now in this time frame um, through April. And um, a teacher that um, may have the master's degree, we go to them and say, would you be willing to become the, the Sinclair teacher, the Wright State teacher? And they fill out the paperwork uh, to get that credential to teach the CCP classes. So we have time, and they can get it easily done between uh, when we decide we're going to offer that class for next year. They have plenty of time to get all that paperwork into the university until school starts. And then, and then they work with them um, on the syllabus. They work with them on the, on the text. We buy all of the CCP classroom textbooks. We buy all of those for the students, um, and then they help monitor and, and work with the teacher on the syllabus, on the, um, uh, the materials, all of that sort of thing. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Board Member Sampson. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Lolly, with the CCP offering uh, in your, your ad, your advertisement, um, are the enrollment numbers low? We've actually, we've actually increased the enrollment numbers in the last couple of years, and we put that emphasis on there. But there's always room for more. And then for parents to enroll, do they have to physically come in the building, or is there a way to do an online enrollment option? No, they don't enroll. They, they, their student talks to the counselor and says, I'd really like to get into CCP. The parent has to attend a CCP meeting so they know what the requirements are. Every counselor offers CCP meetings. Most of the time it happens in, uh, before the April deadline, so they should be setting them up right now. Then we talk about FAFSA, we talk about um, you know, different things with parent meetings. That particular parent meeting is for CCP to understand what that actually means for my student. That's the, that's the requirement. Then the student is, by the counselor's work, the student is then enrolled into our CCP classes within that building. So it's just like I was enrolling regular English class. And the only time after that that they start to enroll is they have a counselor that's assigned to them at Sinclair when they're ready to go on campus or when they're ready to take another class that is not offered in our building, then the student has a counselor that they work with um, with Sinclair. Sinclair bills us. So the parent doesn't have to worry about getting a bill unless the student fails the class and then there is a policy that says they have to reimburse us. So that's an incentive for the student to do well and to, and to pass that class. Right. So the, the, the parent's commitment is to coming to that meeting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lally. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions? Board Member Wick Gagne. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief Dooley, Superintendent Lally. I think we're making great progress here. I think as, you know, uh, Dr. Goodwine would mention, I mean, this is an ever-moving, ever-changing world that we live in, and uh, it's interesting to have these uh, strategic conversations around what DPS needs, what our students need, what our families need, and I think that doing deeper conversations, you know, is really going to be important to us moving forward. My thoughts always go back to, like, um, even my, 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 my questions really center around the guidance counselor piece of it. And I, uh, a lot of our students making sure that students have ample time with these guidance counselors where they are directed. I think as a young, uh, you know, 13, 14 year old junior high kid uh, and family to understand all of the rich opportunities that are available through DPS in our programs, we kind of get stuck in this is our neighborhood school or this is near where we live, but hey, what about this school over here that's doing all these wonderful things? And what are we doing to make sure that our students are aware of all of these opportunities and then their families too? Because, you know, I'm a parent, I'm going to guide my, my young human as I think that best fits their needs and, and those sorts of things. So a um, little bit of that. 
Um, with our PIO office, we um, have uh, done quite a bit of advertising uh, and actual direct mail uh, to our families to talk about CCP, how you call, how you look online, that sort of thing. And then again, um, we've been we've been doing that for about three years now, pretty pretty steadily giving a steady diet to eighth graders or giving a steady diet to our freshmen um, of the of those kind of um, contacts with us. Um, the the parent meeting for CCP is important for parents to attend because a ninth grader can take CCP if they qualify. Uh, so that's important for any any parent ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth grade to attend that. Uh, because they can get their child into CCP classes early. Um, the other the other parts of that are just um, what what we do in the schools and just the counselor talking to the students. One of the reasons, if you recall, a few years ago that we added the middle school counselors was for that very reason to to try and talk to parents, try to talk to students, try to make sure that we had some career pathways, and and college pathways, whatever you want to call it. Those those pathways opened up for our students. And, and hopefully, they're having career fairs. They have career fairs um, at the buildings that are actual careers. Uh, but then we also have the school fairs where they get to visit the schools. And two years ago, before COVID hit, we actually had a big Sinclair. Um, we used Sinclair, and we had a, um, all, the, all the groups come in from Ponens, and the kids got to experience what carpentry uh, would look like, what, what culinary looked like, what teacher education looked like for that day whenever it was their turn to come there. So really trying to force that um, idea that we need to expose them uh, a bit more than what, what we used to do whenever people just assumed, okay, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that. Really trying to, to make sure we're doing that. And even to with the, um, the other al alternative options with the, the SEALs and the uh, foundation of leadership, I mean, for some of our, our, our students that may be struggling a little bit, are those opportunities made clear to our families and, and to those, those students as a possibility? Even with Mound Street, I mean, not everybody wants to go to school right now. I mean, it's, it's a different world that we mm -hmm. live in, so to understand, like, there is a Mound Street Academy, there, there are a lot of options, so. Um, I'm gonna ask Chief Dooley to, um, she works directly with uh, the counselors on those projects. Yeah. One of the things, um, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was the middle school counselors had the opportunity to actually write their comprehensive school counseling plan, which is not something that existed prior to that. Um, time was available and they had a lot of work sessions where they collaborated with each other to address their standards, come up with themes for social emotional learning, how they were gonna manage the direct and indirect services. Um, and part of what we did was assign timelines where they, were ex they are expected, this is something that they came up with and they wrote, their timelines for when do we start in talking about graduation requirements? When do we start talking about um, getting the kids on the Ohio Means Job uh, website to become familiar with that so that we understand that's, this is where we begin our work towards an Ohio Means Jobs readiness seal. So um, that work was really productive. So thank you for the pandemic for that. Um, but they have a very uh, scripted um, calendar of events and topics that they address at the middle grades. We haven't made that much progress with a high school, school comp uh, comprehensive counseling plan although we have a skeleton to it. But the middle school people really did a nice job and um, I'm really, really proud of their work. So they, they have addressed a lot of those things that you've, that you've mentioned. Any Thank other you. questions? I have a question. Dr. Goodwin. If you guys aren't already doing it, when you put out the CCP advertisement, can you send it to us so we can send out to our network as well since you said the deadline was coming up in April? just a little blurb or something for us to get out to our networks to try to get more people into it. We can, we can have PIO do that and we'll send it to you as well. Appreciate um, it. But the, um, the counselors are the ones that actually set up the meeting. So they'll have to go back to the buildings and ask their individual counselor when the date is, but they advertise in the buildings too, but we'll get something put together and uh, get it out both to, to the board and to the public on our, on our uh, sites again. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I did have just one last question. 
And it may be a, a two-part question. Chief Dooley, has there been any ideas or desires around courses um, that there's a want for, but we don't have the, the ability to offer it at some of the schools? It's a good question. Um, you know, the, the kids sometimes bring up that they are interested in what we would call family consumer science type classes, um, basic living skills, cooking, sewing, personal finance. Um, those were common courses decades ago and then they were slowly phased out as was that licensure for teachers. Um, but we do hear kids asking for that. So in our, in our um, college career ready course that's available at the high school, some of the teachers have infused some of that information, but it's not like you might remember your exposure to family consumer sciences as a student. Don't try to age me, Chief Dooley. <laughs> well, I had those courses too, so. Um, that is something that they have asked for. Um, they do ask for computer gaming. They don't always really know what that means, um, but they can access that at three schools out of our six currently. Um, those are the two big ones that I, I hear. And, and that, that goes to the second part because that is something I see. I know we have, um, there's a, a, Dun, a Dunbar alumni who actually is, runs the Brooklyn Nets gaming team. Like, it's a real thing now. So, you know, it's, that's part of his career is running. So then my second part to that is, if we're not able to always offer it in school, is there a way that we could then make it something that could be an after school program a club, something there so then that student or those students could still get a taste of that even if it's not during the school day. Is there a way that we could probably offer it after school? I know at some schools, you know, kids are doing maybe like a ceramics piece where they're not getting a grade for it, but they're, it's an after school thing. So is there a way, and this might go to a bunch of other people, but a way that we could look at possibly starting some after school kind of things to offer some of these to students even if we can't do it as a course? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that um, our outreach student activities coordinator is uh, planning a survey uh, to see what uh, interest levels are. Um, we, we know some things and we've started some things, but I think that's um, in the plans. But I, I also wrote down that maybe we need to, to think about, um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to date myself, but I'm going to, the, <laughs> home, ec type, uh, the home ec type class for summer programming and offer it as a, as a two week summer program or something like that because I've had students, when I've had my leadership meetings with them, they've asked me, is there a way that we can learn how to read a rental contract? Can somebody teach us how to, um, how to look at our, our bank account and make sure that it's real and it's right? You know, how do I balance, and basically how do I balance my checkbook, which we'll be doing in financial literacy and, and we're doing now some with the career um, uh, programs, I believe. So um, those are those are important things for them. You know, how do I make a budget that I stay within what I earn? How do I create that budget and keep my family within that budget? Those are those are real questions, and they want to know that. So um, I'll I'll speak to um, uh, to um, Chief Murdoch about uh, potentially asking if we can have a summer uh, class um, that we that's like what used to be home ec or consumer science uh, type programming. And we wouldn't need somebody with that degree necessarily to teach it. We could have anybody basically who understands and knows the, the content teach it. I appreciate that. I just really think having the ability to just do more, have these kind of resources, be able to, to be in safe spaces, uh, just to, to augment what we already offer, see how many things that we can bring on. Um, are there any other final questions? I'll go to Dr. Goodwine first, then I'll finish it up with Board Member Sampson. Had a two-part question. Oh, the first one is, do we do, do you do any adjunct teaching at the junior and senior level in the high school at all? Like similar to what you get in college, where a person comes in for a course and then they're gone after that. We have some adjuncts. Um, I don't know if they're all across the district or if they're just mostly at Stivers, 
Um, those people tend to be maybe professional musicians who come in and either do master classes, private lessons, um, that kind of work. Is that what you're asking? So yeah, so we I, I know we do it as five yeah. I'm talking more like in other fields. So if there was a law class and you had a law professor or someone coming oh. to teach you, things like that in the academic side, not necessarily just the art side. Not to my knowledge. Right. Not Is there any knowledge. opportunity to start thinking about that to kind of supplement some of the need that we talk about when it comes to like the cost of teachers? Um, we actually probably need to check that with the Ohio Department of Ed uh, licensure mm -hmm. um, because I don't know that we can grant credit uh, to students for that type of class. The Stiver students are in uh, basically private lessons with adjuncts for the most part, is that correct? Correct. Um, so we need to check that and see um, if, if someone who's unlicensed but has the credential mm -hmm. can come in and teach and students can gain credit for that particular course. Uh, we'll, we'll check on that with the licensure at the Ohio Department of Ed. Okay, and then my second question for you, because I, I think I saw it at Meadowdale, the sports medicine or therapy type program. Are there opportunities to kind of expand, even if it is in the, in the club type way, to other schools, since that's a real big part of the sports world, where it's just not just playing a sport to do something, but learning about the other parts, because those also turn into careers for individuals. So my question is, are there opportunities to expand and even try to find some ways to connect other schools to the sports medicine and sports therapy type of environment or pathway or things like that for students. We have um, Kettering Health does all of our um, uh, trainer work for us. Uh, we can have conversation with them about the possibility of them having student trainers mm -hmm. who they work with them uh, because you're, what you're talking about is. Um, uh, going out on the football field, wrapping an, a knee, you know, wrapping an ankle or something, getting some experiences that are that are in that field, right? Yeah. That's uh, right. So we can we can have that conversation with Kettering Health to see if there's a way for their trainers to offer some opportunities for some students. It would be a small number of students at that point, right? Uh, but at least it would be more than there are now. So right. we can we can have that conversation with them. And with Board Member Sampson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one of the things that I've, I've listened to in this presentation is ways to make education um, impactful, relational. And in the program of studies, do we as a district have any program of studies that is culturally relevant to our students um, where their culture is exciting? They get to learn. I mean, we have different diversities within the district. Do we have any course of studies that focuses on, that is culturally relevant for all of our scholars in the district? As far as specific course offerings, um, I, other than African American history, um, I can't say that we do currently. Thank you, Chief Dooley. Um, if there are no other questions, I think you're all for, for today, and I appreciate you. And we look forward to building on some of the conversations that we had here and looking to see how we can grow and, and offer our students some of the things that we talked about here at this conversation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move to our superintendent's recommendation. So Dr. Lolly, your first recommendation, please. Um, my first recommendation for review is the um, Human Resources Agenda, and um, it's listed there for you if you have any questions about um, any um, person or any topic on this list, please let us know. Um, we're um, happy to answer those questions. Thank you, Dr. Lally. Are there any questions from the board? Yes. Dr. Goodwine. So I see on page two of the human resource paper, I see several positions filled in our athletics. Do you, do either of you guys know how many additional positions are open for the spring sports? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but we'll get that for the board. Um, okay. Chief Harmon, I know that there are some that are being uh, onboarded, uh, but they aren't on the agenda, is that correct? 
Sorry, you can hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two different HR. There's one for a vote, and then there's one just more, the, the much longer just review list. The for a vote uh, is only six names, uh, and that is um, due to timing of our, we're trying to onboard uh, and actually having a full day uh, of training with any new employees. We're starting that at the beginning of any uh, pay period. So uh, there are six names that uh, it is our hope that you will vote uh, to allow to start to work. Um, but yeah, there's a much longer list that is, is for purely for review. Did I answer the question? Um, we'll, find, we'll find out the number of, of uh, open positions for you and get that out to the board. Um, because I know they're constantly interviewing and filling them and onboarding them. Okay. Uh, but sometimes they don't have the paperwork in for them to make it to the agenda. That's why uh, we've tried to, to vote every time so that we can get people started. Uh, so um, we'll um, update you on that, and uh, I'll get that number from uh, uh, Executive Director Jones. Dr. Lally, I do have a question. Um, if you could tell us what will be the plan to finish up the year in our um, fine and performing arts department. Um, yes, it's with um, it's with sadness that um, that I say that Justin say um, is resigning to take a principal position um, mm -hmm. in Columbus, and who he will be leaving us. Um, but what we're planning on doing until we find the appropriate replacement is um, Stacy Maney, who is the uh, one of the executive directors in HR, is an art person. Um, as you know, I am also a music person. And we have a music person already there, so uh, we're going to be pitching in, um, working with them. I, um, I've also, in my past, supervised um, K through 12, uh, band and orchestral and choir, so I'm, I'm comfortable stepping in. But we are posting um, a, a part-time secondary music position, a part-time art uh, position, and a part-time physical education position to support uh, those um, groups of teachers that Justin and uh, uh, Miss Milligan have been supporting. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If not, then I do have another question. Um, and it's two part. One, understanding, and there's been a lot in the news lately um, around that the fact that there's not only just a teacher shortage locally, there, that's, it's a national thing. So what kind of things are we then doing to one, retain, but then also when we're getting new hires, are we you know, looking in and I, kind of, I think this also goes into what board member Sampson asked, you know, if there's a teacher who was interviewing and says, you know, hey, I want, I'd love to be able to come in and teach a, um, a African, African American um, literature program or, or a literature class uh, elective uh, that just authors that are women. You know, these kind of things that people come in and have these ideas, these young kids coming in with these bright ideas, and knowing that we are facing a national teacher shortage, and so we'll be in um, a, a real hunt to try to get staff. Are we doing things like that to really, I know when we come through and we interview people, how are we getting to really know people? And saying, hey, you know what, this is where you might be able to do this. I think you can add more than just, just teaching. I think these are, how, do you, how can you feel you can be a best fit and grow and feel like this is a partnership and you're not just a staff member, but you feel like you come in and say you come in to Belmont, you, you're part of Belmont, you come in to Dunbar, you're bringing something there, especially seeing how we're going to be fighting for staff. So I don't know if there's answers, but did want to put that there and kind of, kind of let us wrestle with that of how are we doing that, understanding that we're facing those kind of things. Um, one of the things that, um, that we do, um, not, not in the hiring process, but one of the things that we do is we, we do talk to those teachers in every building to see if they have an interest in teaching a specific class. So if somebody came to us and said, you know, I'd really like to teach, um, I'd really like to teach Swahili to my students, then we would say to them, okay, you need to work with curriculum, write the course of study, and then we need to recruit the students after the board approves the course of study. And then they would, they would sign up for those classes, recruit the students, sign up for the classes. So teachers um, who have the licensure to teach that particular course have the freedom to come to, um, to their principal, freedom to come to, to Chief Murdoch, 
chief, uh, any of the chiefs, and just say, I'd really like to teach this, how do I go about doing it? And the steps are that you express the interest, that you then talk with the curriculum department about what the course of study, because you have to have a course of study for a course. You have to have it approved. So it can't be by the, you know, fly by night or anything like that. You have to have that course of study approved by the Board of Education. And then the Board of Education has to approve any materials that you purchase or that we purchase for that class. So those are the steps for that. But we, we talk to teachers every year. Um, I think, Chief Dooley, you said that you surveyed all the, the teachers again this year before we put the program of studies together uh, to come up with those. So um, new teachers are welcome to offer those ideas. Senior teachers are welcome to offer those ideas. I think to follow that, I'm sorry, uh, Chief Harmon, I didn't mean to cut you off that. No, I was only going to just add very slightly that, you know, as, you know, teachers bring all kinds of ideas like that all the time. I, I think back to, you know, 20 years ago when I was in a classroom, you know, you, there's a lot of things you just do. Like, I want to have a book club, I'm going to have a book club. Like, you just do those things as a teacher, too. But, I, you know, I think your, your, your point is, is well made as well. So always looking for uh, additional ways. Oh, and to follow up that part, Dr. Lolly, where knowing that we have to have um, everything ready to send to the state, how or is there kind of a, a counselor of some sorts, a help guy for a teacher who may not know exactly how do I shape this into something? Is there somebody that can say, hey, you have this great idea, let me show you how you shape it into a course plan? Um, the curriculum team does that. Okay. So if, if, I have a, if I have something that falls along the social studies lines, like some of the classes you're talking about, Mr. Sampson, the social studies coordinator would work with that person to make sure that it follows what the state requires, uh, that there are testing items that are in there that are, you know, that are legitimate and valid. Uh, they would work with them very closely on that. And then the curriculum team is actually the team that brings it forward to uh, me for recommendation to the Board of Education. So that's kind of the sequence of events. The teacher goes to uh, the curriculum team. Curriculum team helps develop the stuff that needs to be developed, looking at the materials that need to be purchased. And, and they also purchase those materials because that becomes a course once you approve it. And then um, they get the help um, implementing it after uh, I bring it to the board for the approval process. So then it becomes, it becomes part of the program of studies for the next year as well. Board Member Sampson. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Lally, in line with this, that conversation, what is usually the turnaround time? Like, how long does that process take? It depends on how fast the teacher writes the course of study. Thank you. Yeah. And, and if, you're, if you're serious about the class for the, for the fall, um, we, try to have it, we try to have it done before the teacher leaves for the summer so that the materials can be ordered and they can be here when the kids get here. Of course, the study has... Uh, could be approved by the board, for example, in June, materials ordered, and then they'll be here uh, for the August start date. Thank you, Dr. Lally. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Goodwin. i just like to echo back on the first part of the question that you asked about the retention, how we're doing that. And I just want to just say that I saw some really great things in all the schools that I visited with that value proposition of teachers. And I really encourage you guys to, to look at some of your stronger schools that have lower turnover with entire staff to try to just see some of those strategies that are being in place in those cultures. And you can really see the difference. And it, it could be as simple as the schools that have, they've created a teacher lounge that's not like a traditional lounge, it's more of a self-care lounge for you to just take a moment. And seeing that for one school versus a school that doesn't have that, that's a big difference in the culture there. And just really looking at just that value proposition outside of this stuff because they're still people and they still feel stuff and feeling value helps. So I definitely encourage you guys to really, I mean, I think your chiefs are doing a great job staying in tune with the people in their areas. But if you go deeper than that level and you see some of those cultures that have, I think, less than 5% turnover, you'll see that that culture has a little bit more. They're going above and beyond to make sure that those people feel something. Yeah, just check out some of those stat, those teams and what they've found successful. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. Any other questions? <clears throat> Dr. Lally? Um, I, don't, I don't have a question, but um, we do need to uh, mention that we lost um, two staff members um, within the last couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> Dorothea uh, Norvell, is a, uh, she was a paraprofessional for us. She's been in the district for over um, 35 years. 
and um, very loyal, uh, paraprofessional, um, worked every day um, as a bus paraprofessional and supported the students that uh, were on her bus and just did a great job for us. And then we also lost uh, one of our SROs, um, um, Nicholas uh, Collier, and Mr. Collier had been with us for the last couple of years, um, and we, we lost him also uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks as well. And I'd like to express our condolences to both their families, and uh, it's a loss of both of them for the, the Dayton Public School District. Um, and we just wanna let their families know that we appreciate the work they did do here and, and that we, we feel the loss of, of them being here with us. Thank you, Dr. Lally, and I definitely wanna say second that. It's been a lot of loss this year and we wanna, wanna really make sure that we're, we're taking care of each other. And I think that really also goes into some of the pieces that Dr. Goodwine talked about. We really do have to, to, to look after each other and the people that we see on these human resources charts, even though they're listed in numbers, they're, they're people. And there's a story behind every one of them, so we definitely wanna lift all our people up. Um, are there any other questions, comments? If not, Dr. Lally, can we go to your next recommendation, please? Yes, and this recommendation. This recommendation is for a vote. Um, these are new hires, and I know we don't typically vote at um, review sessions, but uh, we'd like to have these people be able to be paid um, because they will have completed two weeks worth of work uh, by the by the next pay period, and we would we would ask that the board uh, consider a vote on um, hiring them. I'll take a motion on this recommendation. So moved. It's been moved. Do I have a second? Second. It was moved by Board Member Wick Gagne and seconded by Board Member Spencer Reinert. Any questions? If there are none, Treasurer, may we have a vote? President Smith? Yes. Mrs. Reinert? Yes. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Mrs. Wigani? Yes. Dr. Pickett? Yes. Dr. Goodwine? Yes. Mr. Lacey? Yes. Seven yeses. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Dr. Lally, your next recommendation, please. Um, my next recommendation is uh, um, to review the uh, contracts that will be up for a vote next week. Um, the first is affordable language services. This is for our, uh, our um, uh, English um, language learners and their parents. And this service is um, offered for um, us whenever we wanna have a parent-teacher conference or we need to schedule a, uh, some sort of uh, conversation with a parent. This is an interpretation service that we've used for several years. This is a, um, an increase in their contract um, to, uh, from um, February uh, 15th through the end of the uh, uh, school year in June, the following year. So it's like a year and a half. Dr. Lally, um, if there are no uh, questions on this one, could you just go through the list of contracts and briefly summarize some of them? Yes. Uh, the next one is um, Cummins Sales and Services. That's a generator um, maintenance plan that we, that we do every year. Um, that will be uh, for them to inspect and, and to repair any of the um, uh, generators that we need to have inspected and repaired. Uh, the next is Ohio State University. This is where we get um, our uh, internet services. And um, it's through the, really like the, the um, higher ed college. Many, many years ago, they started providing that service. Um, this is one of the cheaper um, uh, contracts that uh, we have, and we've been using them for several years. Um, it's 36 months um, and um, a possible two 12-month uh, extension options. There are many schools. Uh, six of the Ohio eight school districts use this um, service through Ohio State. Um, the city of Dayton uh, and other cities and uh, local communities also use it. And it's also um, applicable to an E-rate reimbursement. So this is that particular contract for our, for our internet services for the district. The next one is for uh, contracted transportation services for non-public and charter um, students. We have, uh, we put out an RFP for um, a contract for services like we had this past year. Uh, to see whether or not we can actually um, have a contracted service or if we need to do it in-house. We currently transport um, 4,200 charter non-public students and um, we have um, our own um, 11,800 students to um, bus as well. 
So there was a need to put this out, see if we can actually uh, either um, use this um, outsourcing for the non-public charters or bring it back in-house. So we have a routing group that's actually working uh, to determine which way we can do it uh, the best, whether we can still bus everybody ourselves with this new routing organization or if we still need to contract our services out. So the, I'll have an answer for you by, um, by the time that you vote, probably by the end of this week we'll know what will work best to, to make sure we get students to school. And please understand that, that now with the new law, that if we don't have students, uh, all students to their buildings within a half an hour of the start time, a complaint can be filed with the Ohio Department of uh, Education. Every complaint that's found to be legitimate, the district is fined money off of their transportation reimbursement. So right now there are, there are five districts um, we are not one of them, but there are five districts that have very large, um, very large penalties being uh, weighed against them because they haven't been able to transport their students. So we have to try and have the most viable solution for our students to get to and from school within the new law and the new framework that's been designed for us. And um, we're supposed to take their start times and uh, work around their start times. Uh, and in some of our cases, it's not possible to do that. So we're, we're looking at all angles of this to make sure that we aren't fined and that we don't lose our, re our small reimbursement that we get from um, the state for transportation because the, the reimbursement, um, Treasurer, you might want to say what the reimbursement is. Uh, the reimbursement is about 7.5 million. And the, co the total cost of transportation is? Um, a year ago, it was uh, 19 million, about 19 million. Yeah, I thought it was about 21, 22, but it's up there and we only get reimbursed a small portion. It was the point, the reason that I asked the treasurer uh, that information. So this one's a really important one to know all the angles and all the pieces and parts of before we actually uh, make a decision. We wanted to put this placeholder on here uh, because this is ESSER money that we would be using if we do this, um, if we do this outside contract. Um, and the reason it's ESSER money is because it's for COVID situations as well. You're allowed to use it to still keep kids, less kids, uh, on a bus during a day uh, for safety reasons. The next one is Skanska. And Skanska is our owner's rep. Um, we want to, uh, we originally hired them to do the um, RFP for us for Welcome Stadium, the, that project. And as the owner's rep, for them to continue with us, uh, we need to increase um, their um, uh, PO, PR to uh, $450,000 to cover phase two, which is taking us through the Welcome Stadium project. And it's not to exceed $496,000. If you recall the, the original bid that came in was um, around $600,000 for that um, owner's rep uh, project. So we are um, asking that the board next week uh, vote to approve this so that they can be the representative who represents the district and protects the district uh, from any situation that might occur during the, um, the uh, construction, reconstruction, and refurbishing of Welcome Stadium. And then the last one is the train company. Um, it's the annual plan maintenance for um, the uh, Opponents, uh, chiller, and cooling tower, not to exceed $5,743. Thank you, Dr. Lally. I saw uh, Board Member Sampson had a question. I have two, Mr. President. Thank you so much. No um, Dr. Lally, with the contract to transportation services, with the new guidelines, if we were to contract with another service, would the district still be fined if the contracted service was 30 minutes late? We yes. would. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the second question is about Sanska, and I may be reading this wrong. It says increase by four hundred fifty thousand, but it says not to exceed four ninety six. We we've already paid them forty seven. Okay. Uh, you voted on a contract for the first phase. I think it was forty seven thousand okay. five hundred something right. like that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. No problem. Any other questions, Dr. Goodwin? Okay, we got a series of questions. So on the participant, on the transportation contract here, can you just tell me a little bit about some of the options that you guys are looking at? 
Um, I can tell you the options we've looked at in the past um, okay. that are that are, we've tried and uh, they haven't quite solved the, the solution. Or they haven't been the solution. Um, the first thing that we did uh, three or four years ago was we um, worked with RTA to get the LS buses that used to run. Um, they would they would stop at the RTA stops and pick up students. Uh, we had those for a year, um, and the. Um, Students would um, go to the RTA stop in their neighborhood, be picked up, and then be dropped off at their, at their high school. We were trying to bus our high schoolers. Um, that seemed to work okay for a little bit, and then um, we had some uh, concerns about that. Uh, the next thing that we tried was we tried to do RTA passes for um, all charters and parochial students so that they could ride the charters on their own and that's when uh, a big um, uh, happening occurred with the Ohio Department of Ed and Dayton Public Schools because the charter parents uh, resisted that. Uh, it's done all around the state of Ohio, but for here, they, they really went up against that um, and they wanted yellow bus service. So then COVID happened and uh, we continued to use yellow bus service for them last year when uh, we were not in session because we could. Uh, we had drivers and we had the buses. Um, then we, we talked about, okay, if we can't use RTA, and RTA had sold off uh, many of their, their buses um, through, the, through this last two years, and they're short drivers also, like, like everybody. So we said, okay, we're gonna try and contract out services, and we don't have to worry about hiring the bus drivers ourselves. So we put out an RFP last year, and um, first student won that RFP, and they've been transporting the parochial and the charters this year. And our yellow bus services, uh, our, our own uh, drivers have been busing all Dayton public school students this year. So those, are, those have been the options that we've done. Okay. And, then, and we still had to pay for, because we're busing high school students, we still had to pay for RTA passes for uh, charter and uh, non-pub students if they wanted to ride RTA and were within the two mile uh, limit that we, that we have to follow. Okay. So knowing that the transportation issue is not like a Dayton issue, it's a national issue. And in our area, there are four, there are four major transportation companies that are similar to first students. Have you guys start looking at alternatives to buses as transporting students and like looking at not going with a singular company because they're also being pulled in other districts, but looking at smaller transportational services to try to meet our needs since it is a, a bigger conversation when we're not, I mean, there are only four companies in our areas that provide these type of services that are within range. When, when we put out an RFP, we opened it up to anyone and we actually had a, um, a smaller company um, put, in, put in a bid for it. And um, the cost of that smaller company using vans uh, would, would be much more than what, what the cost is that we had allotted for uh, in our ESSER funds. So they, they would not be viable for us with the numbers of students that we have to, that we have to transport, that, that particular one that put in the bid. Yeah, no, I mean chopping up the bigger contract into smaller pieces instead of one large contact, contract itself. We've not talked about that because yellow bus service is what uh, the non-pubs requested. That's why, that's why the RTA didn't really work out. Um, because the, the parents went to the state and wanted yellow bus service. Yeah, and I agree with that. It's just, it's the availability of it is a lot, it's, it's less than it is now. So it, even if you guys just think about trying to make this work, because I know last the last time we were at a meeting, we canceled a, we voted to end a contract because it was no longer meeting the need. So just thinking about future projecting or figuring out how we can get as far as possible, hopefully it'd be nice the whole year and not have to, keep talking about transportation services, but just thinking about how we can make, how we can contract with, because it's participants, so it's open right now, with people who meet the needs that we actually have based on the availability that's out there. So just something to consider. Um, I had a second question on the, is it Stanska? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how, tell me how they protect us? I think that's the language you utilize. How they protect us is, is they represent us. So we internally don't have to have somebody who's 
watching the contractors that are being hired for Welcome Stadium. We don't have to watch the architects. They do that for us and they keep us informed. So with the Ludlow, for example, with the Ludlow 2 project, that was an internal project. And uh, we were watching, we were the ones who were responsible for watching everything that happened in this building by any contractor and any architectural move that they made. And there were many things that were missed and it ended up costing us a lot more money because of that. Is this, is this different than the individual that's in the architecture, I mean, in the operations department that does construction, the consultant that's hired on? Or the, would they work with that consultant? They, they will work with them, but there are so many projects we, when we, when we um, agreed that we were going to do the, the upgrades to the buildings, um, that person will, will be doing those. Uh, we'll be monitoring those along with the, um, we have a construction project for the bus garage uh, that they have to monitor that one. They'll do that internally. There won't be an owner's rep, but because of the price tag on this one, the board um, and I felt that we needed to have the, the other board and I felt we needed to actually have an owner's rep this time so that we don't add you know, more money to the project. And how frequently would they report out to the board? Um, they can report out as frequently as we want them to. Um, actually, the the um, Welcome Stadium Building Committee meets with them. Um, it's probably monthly at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. They meet with them monthly at this point to have that information. And then I think I sent my last update about three weeks ago maybe about what had happened so far with the Welcome Stadium project, but they can report out as frequently as we ask them to. Okay, one more question on it. Would they also report the, the, the inclusion that was actually achieved on the project for us as well? It's actually in the contract mm -hmm. for uh, Shook, uh, which you will hopefully see next week uh, when we bring that forward. The, the attorneys are still working on that. Um, there's a report out time frame for that, and Skanska knows um, that, that they need to um, tell us who, what, when, where, how many, what percentage, that sort of thing, yes. Okay. And they are actually here if you would like to ask them that particular question. I think I saw you somewhere. You know, she put you out there, so. <laughs> Do you want to answer the question about how we'll report out about the percentages? Uh, my name is Curtis Ellswick. I'm a senior vice president with Skanska. Also got Nate Minish Weber, who's a senior project manager. Um, but we appreciate the opportunity to serve as your owner's rep on this exciting Welcome Stadium project. But to your to uh, respond to your question, Shook in their proposal uh, committed to achieve a certain percentage, which mm -hmm. was 20 percent of their contract, and we're going to hold that to them. Not only do we take their word for it, we ask them to prove where they've done it in the past and show, they've showed us a whole list of Dayton Public School projects where they've met or exceeded that percentage and some other projects like in the Dayton Metro Library. Um, but as part of their contract, as Dr. Lawley mentioned, we're requiring them to report to us on at least a monthly basis with their pay applications where they stand percentage-wise on inclusion and then also to show us you know, all the background and supporting documents for that. So our job is to continue to make sure we get those reports and not pay them until they till we receive them yeah. and then also help support them and making sure they exceed those goals as best we can okay if they fail to actually meet their goals or they fail to pay their contractors or any of those type of things what type of penalties are put in to ensure that the contractors that they have committed to utilizing are actually utilized and they're I, not just passed throughs I, I think that's a question that we're trying to work out with legal counsel now in the contract okay um, i'm not sure what kind of penalty we can actually enforce other than you know withhold the paying them until they get us the reports and the information okay most of my questions are more for legal so i'm gonna wait for you guys to get that contract together so yeah, and one other piece yeah. to that so part of the reporting process is they have to provide a commercial useful function for the Correct. folks that they're they're doing that that, that helps to overcome the, the pass-through uh, potential um, and folks doing the wrong thing in terms of inclusion we'll check those we'll make sure that they provide those We'll make sure that the certifications they provide are, are from the state or whatever governing agency we, we, we deem appropriate, which would, whether it's the local, um, I forget the, it's the, the local, city of Dayton program, mm -hmm. city of Dayton, or whether it's through, through the state, their edge program, we'll make sure that their certifications are there within those certifications at list divisions and construction that they can utilize to do that work. We'll check to make sure that someone that's, a uh, um, that's listed as a general trades isn't doing plumbing, right? That'd be, that'd be a red mm -hmm. flag, but those kinds of things. 
Are you okay. using the federal standard of, of commercially useful function, or do you guys have your own internal standard? I think we're, we're modeling it after the board's policy, the school district's policy. It's here. very vague in the school district policy. Well, we, we will reinforce that with legal to make okay. sure. I think what yeah. I would encourage us to do is ultimately follow some government agency. Okay. Typically, it's the state. Do a lot of school we'll work with the OFCC. Their policies are pretty good for economically disadvantaged business or enterprise or through their edge um, mm -hmm. is, is likely what will mirror. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank any you. other questions on any other contracts? Ms. Wigonye. Thank you. Um, my question is on the participants piece, just for general information. So if we're using that $6,500,000 number as a, you know, not to exceed to transport what you said was what, 4,200 students a year? That basically equates to like $1,500 a year to transport a, a student. Is that a normal number? I mean, is there a guide that we have that says in transportation, what does it cost on a yearly basis to transport our students? So, I mean, because 1500 doesn't seem that unreasonable in the scope of a 10 month period, you know, and to and from school, that sort of thing. So I wondered if there, these always seem like such big numbers and it's hard to digest. So I'm looking for maybe, uh, um, you know, some information that helps us be more, yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll ask Dr. Burton. Have you seen um, a number that's a per pupil dollar amount that's recommended for transportation? And I, I haven't seen one, so I don't know. I don't know if there is one, but we'll try to research it and find I, it. I mean, I think that moving forward, as we're looking to, as a district, and every district, we're facing bus driving shortages, routing, and that sort of thing. And as we're looking for additional opportunity to transport our students to understand what the average cost is to transport a student a year, and then maybe we can start to implement some of those other uh, possibilities of transportation, at knowing what numbers we use. So just, you know, thinking. Dr. Goodwin. I'll, I'll echo Karen's question. Do you guys have, can you provide us with what we've actually spent in the last couple years on transportation? So from 18, 19, and 20? Um, I, I believe that um, the treasurer uh, emailed you today. With that, we can send that to the rest of the board as well. I, I think I saw an email I, with that. Yeah, I sent you last night. Um, but if you want, I can tell you, in 2019, we spent 15.2 million. In 2020, we spent 19.3 million. In 2021, we spent 11.9 million. For 2022, up to today, we spent 10.5 million. Is that also the cost of the buses that we bought every year? That, does that include the, the buses? Previous year? Yes. That includes what we're paying every year on the buses, no, the loan on the no. buses? What we're paying on the buses is different. Yeah, this so is what we paid okay. already. So, yes, yeah, so the, it would be an increase if you looked at the cost that we pay every year for the loan for the 15. No, it is included. That's what I'm asking. One. Is it included in all the numbers that you gave us, the cost for the buses? Yes. Everything okay. what we paid for transportation, actual expenditure is here. Okay. And um, I was telling Dr. Lally, just an FYI, we bought those buses, what, about seven years ago? And they're out of warranty. Any other questions? Mr. Lacey. I thought that was like five years ago. I think, I think it was five. Yeah, five oh, okay. years ago. I was, try, I was trying to count. Yeah, I was thinking, five. I don't think yeah. it was seven. In 27. Last year, 16. 2016. Oh. They're out of warranty. Okay. At that time, we paid warranty, though. I'm sorry? For 10 years. I'm sorry? I remember we paid, uh, we included warranty. Not on, mm. not on the things that are now on falling. On the 115 buses. Mm. Not on the things that are now falling apart. Oh, I don't know. But we paid 415 yeah, buses. 
Uh, Dr. Lally, I do think with that, if we can get with uh, transportation and kind of get a breakdown of those things, where we are on those warranties, where we are with some of the repairs needed, and that way we can come up with a strategic plan moving forward to go in, inside of the transportation uh, whole piece. Not only getting our kids to school, but making sure we have the upkeep on the buses, especially as we move forward with the, the plans on the, the updates to the transportation building. Dr. Lally asked us to do a presentation to the board on Tuesday, and that right. will be part of the presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any other questions? If there are no other questions, oh, Dr. Lally, were you going to say something? No, no, sir. Okay, I was going to say that um, Dr. Lally did speak on it, but we also, like we said, one of the things that we're doing, because um, I know for those that were on the board previously, that was one of our major concerns was how do we protect the district? Um, I know people have saw things around when Ludlow 2 was going up, how that number jumped. How it went from one million here, now then it's 2.4, now it's three point this. So that's one of the reasons we wanna do that. But then also that was stated at the time is that's why the stadium committee meets um, with Skanska, has, has met with Skanska and meets internally so often. I think sometimes even a couple times a month. I know we've met mm -hmm. maybe three yes. times in the last couple of weeks is to make sure that we're looking at these things, not only from that monetary side, but one of the biggest things we talked about was making sure this project utilizes local companies, making sure it utilizes under, under uh, disadvantaged companies, uh, minority companies. So that's why we're really meeting a lot and really taking a look at those things. So I wanted to put that out there um, for the new board members and for the board members who are there uh, because that was really why we did go with a, a owner's rep to make sure that we were covered on that end as well. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, Dr. Lally, your next recommendation, please. The next recommendation is um, a, um, an ask me uh, memorandum of understanding that you already voted on, uh, but as they went back and they looked at it, um, the attorneys and asked me uh, representatives saw that it was the wrong year on the memorandum. So they caught that and, and you're just revoting on what you already had voted on with a year corrected. So that's what the next one is. Uh, so if it looks familiar to you, um, that's the reason for it. Um, the next one is a memorandum of understanding with uh, Midwest Plains and Equity Assistance Center. This is a no cost memorandum, but I like to put it forward for the board to see it. Uh, we work with this uh, group out of Indiana, and they work very closely with uh, Sharon Goins, the director of our equity and inclusion um, department, and um, work with her on a, on a variety of things, surveys, uh, how to use survey results, what kind of curriculum pieces need to be in place, all of the things that go along with an equity situation. Um, they're, they're an advisory group, uh, if you will, as well as a professional development group that works with Sharon. Uh, so this is just a, a renewal of that um, agreement with them. And again, it is no cost to the district. Any questions from the board? If there are no questions, your next recommendation, please, Dr. Lyle. Um The next one is a, um, the usual Ohio High School Athletic Association membership for uh, school year 23. Um, this is an annual vote uh, that we take from the Board of Education to belong to the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Now, I know on mine, I'm not getting able to click. Is anybody else having that same issue? Yeah, it's not here. For F, it's not clicking. It shows in content, but it's not clicking to open up the link. Okay, you can go to your next recommendation, Dr. Lyle. Um The next recommendation is just a placeholder uh, for Shook um, uh, for the Welcome Stadium Project. They are... Um, the group that won the bid, um, there was an RFP that was put out. Three companies responded to that. Uh, interviews were held with those companies, and Shook was the, the company that was chosen. And um, as um, uh, Skanska talked about, in their proposal, they actually committed to the percentage, uh, whereas some of the other proposals said that they would do it, but they didn't, they didn't commit to a percentage that they would actually use local businesses and... and um, uh, minority businesses and women owned, veteran owned, all those sorts of things that we were asking for. So the contract is being developed. Um, they were chosen at the, I think on, at the end of last week. 
So our attorneys and uh, Skanska have been working on the contract with Shook, and we will have that to you on here before you have to vote on it. So hopefully by the end of this week, we're thinking that um, by the end of this week, we'll have it to you so you can review it for the weekend and we'll have a conversation and, and answer questions next week before you vote. Uh, but this is just a placeholder. Uh, doc, Dr. Lolly, before I ask if there are any other questions, I would ask that we definitely not only just get this out for review, but get it out in time that we can ask any questions, any information that needs to be gathered. Uh, so I would definitely appreciate if we can get that out um, in a manner that gives our board members the time and consideration they need to make solid judgments and questions on those things. And uh, Curtis is shaking his head yes. Uh, so we should have it to you by Friday before the board agenda goes live. Uh, it should be uh, for you to review, so. Okay, are there any other questions? <laughs> Dr. Goodwine. I have a question on the community <coughs> inclusion program. Can you explain to me the 25% on-site workforce though? Say that again. The community, the DPSD community inclusion program, this is the information that you sent me. Can you explain the 25% on-site workforce go? What, what does that mean? That, that's the requirement in an RFP. So it's two different goals. There's a 20%, which is supposed to be like a disadvantaged business go. Understand that one. There's a second goal that's a 25% on-site workforce go. Yeah. So the 20% uh, contract is based on value. Um, and that's purely on trades, subcontractors, as well as uh, design professionals that are participating in the project. That's the 20%. The 25% is measuring of, the, of that 20% in terms of contract that the workers that are physically doing the work on the project meet those, those goals of local or economically disadvantaged. So they're a, they're a minority um, contractor. Um, they're a woman contractor. They're, a, they're from a small bit. Well, I don't think small, I think small business works for that. But they, they meet that criteria to fall within that 25%. Does that make does that, does that make sense? Yes and no. So okay. Let me let me just walk through it. So the twenty percent the twenty percent goal is based on their certifications, whether they're either in the Edge program or one of the City of Dayton programs. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. But in those in those small business goals, they're going to be certified as either a material supplier, manufacturer, or a person that does yep, work. subcontractor. Right. Correct. So you're saying the twenty five percent on site workforce goal is taken from them actually coming on the site doing no, the work? No, it's not, it's not from the business. It's from, it's from the employee. It's the worker physically for doing the work on site that of the workforce, if you have just 100 workers, that 25 of those workers are meet, meet the criteria of inclusion. As so, so you're saying 25% also falls under one of the categories, like a, a minority, a woman, is that what you're trying to I'm say? I'm saying there's a difference. The 20% is based on contract yeah, that's value the to a company. Right, that that's is, the business part. That meets that criteria. Okay? Correct. The 25% is within that company that the folks that are working on the project meet the, that are, are, are of a minority or... Um, um, Hold on. In which yeah. company? In the subcontractor's company or in the prime contractor's uh, company? There's, there's going to be... Shook yeah. or in one of their subs? Uh, both, actually. Both. So Shook could have employees that will have employees working on, on the site. So how they achieve that can be, it could be through one subcontractor, it could be through five subcontractors. It could be, it'll be a mixture of all the folks that are working on this project. This project will include a dozen subcontracting firms. It'll include five different or so design professional firms. You'll have Shook as the uh, design builder. They're the umbrella overall. They'll have staff working on site. So within, within Shook, they may have uh, folks that are working on site that meet that criteria on, on the project. And each subcontractor will as well. Some may be heavier, some may be lighter, just based on the service that they provide. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna need to see it in writing because it, it still doesn't make sense to me Absolutely. what that part is. My second question for you, so on the 20% disadvantage goal, they just committed overall without submitting who they were gonna utilize beforehand. Mm -hmm. They just said they would just meet an overall goal. So you don't actually know right now who they're going to utilize that, for. That's exactly right. So we're, we're hiring a, a professional to design, and then they'll bid um, the project. And with, when they bid the project in packages, like I said, there could be a dozen packages. You'll have, you could have a masonry firm, concrete firm, drywall, HVAC, ceiling, just a whole slew of subcontractors that will be part of this project. After they design, they'll break it into packages, 
and they'll bid this project. And when that happens, um, they will, will make selections based on the lowest responsive that also meets inclusion goals, and they'll be awarded the package at that time. And when that occurs, we'll measure to make sure that we're meeting the goals that we need to. Okay. Because this is a transparent process. When Shook does this, we'll be able to see those bids. We're going to look at those bids to make sure that they're meeting those requirements. Yeah. And I think my last, it's still a legal question, if they don't meet those requirements, because it's a lot harder to get people to meet things after they've already been awarded a bid versus getting them to meet it prior to being awarded a bid. It, it is. Penalty programs are tough. I am not an attorney. I will not pretend to be one. But usually, in most cases in public entities like this, you do not have a penalty program. You have a disbarment. You have a recommendation that they can never work for, um, for you anymore. It's made public. No contractor wants that. That's usually the, the most severe penalty, but I will default to, to the district attorneys on what the, the best approach is to achieving that. Mr. Lacey. So do we don't, do we not have a design? No, there, there, is no, there is no design yet. What we did was we went out for bid for a design build company. That was the first phase that we just finished. I mean, so are there specs for them to, I mean, are, are we asked, is there a list of things that we want them to do for 13 million? Yes, there's a, there's a list of things that, uh, one of the things that Skanska did, um, UD and Dayton did a review, um, I think it was two years ago. They took that review and uh, did an additional review of what the needs were, what must happen at Welcome Stadium. And then the district uh, committee added what the, we wanted to happen at Welcome Stadium. Then we compared the two, and that's what was put into the, um, the actual uh, RFP, letting them know that this is what we were looking at and what we needed to have happen and then what we wanted to have happen in addition. So, for example, a want is that we, we would like to have an elevator that goes to the press box. That's a want. Um, but a need is that we have to we have to look at all the plumbing and and switch out all the plumbing in the building to modernize it and meet the code. So they have that list. They have all those specs that uh, went through. That was probably a was it three month process. It's about a three month process. Contract. Say again. And those will be in the contract. They all they know all those things are part of, of what we're looking at. Yes. And you you want to address that? Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think what may help is this is, this is what, you're, what you're gonna approve with their contract as a professional service, okay? Just like you would, um, uh, in the state of Ohio, there's many ways to procure construction publicly now since construction reform. You can just do the traditional way where you just hire an architect through a professional service, they, they design a project, then they bid it, and someone's awarded that bid based on lowest responsive, right? That takes, that takes time. What the state allowed public entities to do in 2019, actually in no, 2009, I'm sorry, it's been a while, um, is you can procure it different ways. There's construction management at risk. There's multi-prime. There's, in this case, design build. Design build, there's a, there's a slew of advantages to doing it. One is speed. If we were to do it the traditional way, you would have to hire a design firm. You go through this process just like you are now, bring them on board. We'd have a, a number of meetings. They would put a design together over, say, nine months. And then we would bid that project, and the project wouldn't fin finish for probably a year or more after that. In this case, what it allow, what it, what this does is it brings the designer, the builder, um, to the table with you. So it's a collaborative design and a collaborative approach, and it allows it to go into 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 place faster. Um, and uh, um, it's just in, in in terms of this delivery overall, is is pretty is, is one of the best approaches. Does that make sense? And, and they're insured. I mean, we'll we'll be voting on thirteen million for them. You'll you'll be it's actually eleven. It's it's around eleven million. But you'll see that. Would it be helpful for um, the board to see the wants and the needs list that the the subcommittee has been working off of? It, it shows you every single thing, and there's some cost estimates on there as well. Okay. That's how we got the number. Uh, so we can we can give that out to the board. Good one. Who's on the Welcome Stadium Committee? Yeah, I've never heard of that. This is myself, Ms. Lee Gagne, Dr. Lally, Mr. Hurwitz, um, who else is here? Drew, uh, project manager, and 
Executive Director Jones. And Rick Rayford. All right. How how often can you guys report out to the board of what's happening on the Welcome Day in I mean Welcome Stadium? As, as often as you'd like. Yeah, yeah. Probably every month. If you guys are meeting every month, I mean, because there's yeah. a lot of new information. And I think I sent the last, I, I can't remember the date, but I sent the last one out. But we have not sent out to you the wants and the needs. And that would probably be very interesting and helpful to you to see that because the process has been a three-month process of, of gathering how things are at Welcome, what needs to be replaced. And there have been some internal uh, repairs that had to be done immediately. So our team did that. Uh, there's also been some other analysis like underground piping. Do we have to replace that? We found that there are two places that it's blocked. So we can send that out to you uh, so you can see the actual things that are must happen to refurbish welcome. Yeah. Lighting, Lighting, sound equipment. So it's, it's a two, three page thing at least of so I'll, I'll share that out. Can we put a third person on the on the committee? Because it's only two board members right now. We can talk about it. Are there any other questions? That concludes my um, recommendations for reviews, uh, President. We're there. Before you do, well, it, we were able to see that the OS, uh, the OSHA membership, but if there are no uh, comments or questions on that, we can move off of that to the treasurer's recommendations. Okay. What I have here is a temporary, we're requesting for temporary advance to the in, for the emergency connectivity reimbursement grant, which is um, 599 from general fund, eight, $850,000. The money is going to be reimbursed. Uh, when the money is reimbursed, we are going to take that, uh, that money from uh, connectivity fund to the general fund. Are there any questions for the treasurer? Treasurer, your next recommendation, please. My next one is certificate of amended uh, resources. Uh, what it, uh, we did in here is moving fund from general fund to 599 for the amount of temporary advance. Any questions from the board? Your next recommendation, Madam Treasurer? Okay. The next one is supplemental appropriation. The same way, uh, what we are doing is we moving, we increasing general fund by the amount 850 for the advance for today's, and the when they repay, we are uh, repay for the repayment. We are increasing 599, which is the connectivity fund by three, uh, 3.7 million because last month we did the 2 million and um, now we put in 850 for the advance, 850 when they repay it. So it, it looks like a double, but it is not. Any questions on that recommendation? If there are none, your next recommendation, Madam Treasurer? Okay. Um, the next one is the minutes, uh, approval of the minutes for a January organizational meeting and January 18 business meeting. I don't think you will have a question no. on that one. We'll no, ma'am. I don't think so. You can go to your next recommendation, please. Okay. Donations. I have donations, which is very good. Uh, I have donations from Area B. Uh, $100 to Dayton Public Schools. Um, Dr. Uh, Gabriela Pickett for McKinney Bento, $200. Johnny Watson for McKinney Bento, $50. Uh, Lisa Hanwar and uh, Susan Spiegel, $1,000 for Dayton Public Schools. 
new follow, uh, fellowship uh, Baptist Church for making event $120. Thank you so much. We yeah, appreciate definitely. the we, donations. We want to say thank you to everybody mm -hmm. that donated, and especially one of uh, those names looks very familiar, so we appreciate <laughs> all the donations that come from our community. And as always, we definitely appreciate what goes into uh, the McKinney-Vento program um, and all the work that they do for so many less fortunate youth and families. Your next recommendation, please, Madam Treasurer. Okay, the next one is purchase requisitions. These purchase requisitions are from different departments. Let's look together, and if you have any questions, we'll answer them. Are there any questions for any of the purchase requisitions? Question for you. It's a good one. Also, I have a statement. When the treasurer finishes hers, I do have a question on the OSHA thing, but I'll wait till it's finished. The first student, first student is the, the company that does our routing services. That's the one you were speaking of earlier as well. And that's the same company that was doing the busing services too, correct? It's actually a subset of them. Um, Dr. Byrne, you want to explain that relationship? The company we work with is called First Planning Solution. And First Planning Solution does routing for a number of school districts. Um, uh, and it's a subset of First Student, but, um, and it does, it does routing. It's just nothing but routing for us and a number of other districts around the country. Okay. And how's that been going this year? Um, they've done a wonderful job. They had to step up to the plate, um, what, in October when we had to um, go back and redo routing, and they were able to get us up and on our feet in, what, about six weeks? About four to six weeks going back and forth vetting, and um, they've gotten our routes down quite a bit, uh, and um, they, um, they've put together a plan that we're gonna share with the, with the board on Tuesday of what we believe would be efficient routing based on the data that they um, were able to do. They are experts in routing, so they have a number of individuals who've been doing this work for about 20 or 30 years. And we're very satisfied with the services they provided. Okay, can you show in that plan, if you already weren't planning to, just where we were before them and how we've changed since we've had them so we can kind of see the comparison of how it's increased our service? So, you, like, do you mean so? You mean the number of routes? You want to see how many routes we had before they intervened? Because that's what they did. Like, right. we may have been at 100 and I don't know, 140, 160 yeah. routes, and they were able to get us down to 105. Okay. Yeah. You just want to see the effectiveness of them. Yes. So, how are you quantifying that? Just we'll, show us that. We'll bring that in when we do our presentation on Tuesday. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll take some time. Oh yeah, have one more. I had a statement actually. Yes. On I did see this is we're on purchase requisitions, right? Yes, ma'am. I do want to shout out that I see that we did business with a Dayton local minority owned PL Mechanical LLC, and that's awesome. So I do want to shout that out. That's it. Appreciate that. If there are no other questions, comments. Treasurer, your next recommendation, please. Uh, I have one then in now. Uh, that is BSN Sports Inc. for 4498 Any questions, comments from the board? I see there are no, oh, there is can one. You, can you explain to me how then and now works? Anyone? No. Yeah. Okay, uh, then and now is um, the invoice comes be before the purchase requisition. Okay. That is the reason why we're calling it then and now. Okay, and I had a question on the actual description of this then and now, because it's for book bags, for athletic staff, coaches, site manager, tablet covers for board members and the superintendent's office. How, how is this gonna look on our audit? I, if I uh, 
let's look for the purpose on this. And uh, if it is for public purpose, the audit will be okay. Okay. All they look is for whether it's for public purpose. Those expenditures. But this went. This just went to employees, including ourselves. Less. Is that right? uh, That's a yes or no. Um, the athletic director uh, purchased um, these items for the people listed there. So the athletic staff, the coaches, the site managers, um, and um, the uh, board members received one of the book bags, and so did uh, the superintendent's office. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, the district did. Correct. She yeah. she put in. I mean, the, the, the wording is it sounds. It looks like they. <laughs> that the director brought out his or her checkbook, and no, they didn't. No, they didn't. she purchased it with her, with her funds. With, with the district funds. Correct, with her athletic funds, Gifts yes. Gifts for employees. Yeah. Okay. I think it looks like crap, actually. And, mm -hmm. and basically, this is uh, the, it's very similar to when you purchase shirts, um, and you give, you know, you give them uh, to give people. Them it's that, it's yeah. that kind of thing that, uh, that was done. Are there any other questions? If none, we'll go to your next recommendation, Madam Chair. The last one is a placeholder for monthly financials since uh, the uh, financial committee is going to meet on uh, Thursdays. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodwine, you said you had something to go back for the OSHA thing. Yes, is Belmont Middle School not in athletics? They're getting added on there. Okay, because they were missing, so that was the part. Yeah, we've already noted it and put them, to put them on there. So, pursuant to section 121.22G2 of the Ohio Revised Code, I move that this board go into executive session in room one, well, no, we're not in 116 anymore though. We're upstairs in our, board meeting room. This meeting is to be being held to consider the employment of public employees, including compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment, and to consider the employment or dismissal of employees. Is there a second? Second. It has been seconded by board member uh, Dr. Pickett. May we have a roll call, please? Um, hang on one second, Mr. President. Was there um, an item on executive to discuss um, potential legal action as well? Did we want to? Yep. It was the were they were they here? I didn't think they were audited. It was not to discuss something with legal, but to discuss a legal matter. Yeah, uh, oh, okay. And then we can add it on there. One moment. Just let me know when I can refresh. been out. Let me go back down. And I would like to uh, uh, amend that motion to also include a conversation about pending legal matters as well. Do I have a second? No, second. Thank you. May we have a vote? President Smith? Yes. Mrs. Reinhardt? Yes. Mr. Sampson? Yes. Mrs. Wigani? Yes. Dr. Pickett? Yes. Dr. Goodwine? Yes. Mr. Lacey? Yes. Seven yeses. Thank you. We will move into executive session. Please join me upstairs, please. Thank you.